Orders pursuant to order, the question shall now the Senate shall now move the questions without notice. Oh. Is that your water? Yes. And I call Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Why did the Morrison government decide to launch the coronavirus booking website five days earlier than the medical appointment booking industry had been told? Does the minister understand the extent of the chaos that followed as a result? Is this an example of the minister's claim that the vaccine rollout is, and I quote, going quite well? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, I think that the ramp up of the rolling of the rollout of the vaccination process continues uh, to order con continues to progress. And, Mr. President, and 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 yes, I, it is actually, I think, going quite well, Mr. President. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, yesterday was always going to be a busy day. Yesterday was always going to be a busy day. The first day where Australians could contact there uh, was, was, was always going to uh, be a day where people uh, sought to gain access to the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and in fact, 98 per cent of those people who uh, checked the website to check whether they were uh, eligible for the vaccine got through on the first time. Got through it the first time, 98%, 381,000 people, Mr. President. Mr. President, so Order. well, that's not true, Senator. Some people can book on online, Mr. President. And this and this vaccination process was always going to start slowly and build up. And as I said yesterday, Australians need Order. must be patient. They should be patient. Every Australian who wants a vaccination will have access to a vaccination, Mr. President. And we are scaling up the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccines become available. Uh, and we will continue to do that, Mr President. We said that we'd start the Pfizer vaccine rollout in February, and we did. We said we'd start the AstraZeneca rollout in early March, and we did. And we've, na and we've now said uh, and we've now started the, the rollout of phase B, which will commence next week, Mr President. And Mr. President, can I say to all of those in doctor's surgeries, thank you for your forbearance. To, to all of those on the, on the phone lines yesterday, thank you for the work that you did. And can I say to all Australians seeking a vaccination, be patient, be polite, and Order, you will get the Senator vaccination Colbeck. when Senator you need Ayers, it. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. In stark contrast, industry sources have said that they were told the booking website was going live next Monday and that the early launch, and I quote, eroded patients' trust in, on, in online bookings in one day. Was the Morrison government so desperate for a good news day that it was prepared to erode confidence in the booking system on day one? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The only, the only people eroding the confidence in the vaccine roll is, is the relentless negativity of those on the other side, Mr. President, Order. who at every turn and at every opportunity try to tear the process down, Mr. President. We have always said that we would build the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccine became available, and, Mr. President, that's what we are doing. Mr. President, so the relentless negativity of those on the other side is the thing that's eroding the confidence in people uh, on the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. And as, and as I said, 381,000 people yesterday were able to access the website at their first opportunity. 98% of those who wanted to access the website, Mr. President. So it's the relentless negativity of Labor and those on the other side that are causing causing uh, concerns about the vaccine rollout, uh, and we will continue to ramp up the vaccination process Order, as I've Senator said as more vaccine Senator becomes Ayers, available. A final supplementary question. In response to the vaccine booking bungle and the delayed rollout, Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, has said, and I quote, what is occurring now isn't a surprise to me or the New South Wales government, and that reaching the vaccine targets, and I quote, will not happen in the current program. When even the Liberal Premier of New South Wales has no confidence in the Morrison government, how can anyone else? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, 
uh, one, one thing that you learn in this place is not to take everything that Labor say at face value, because their record of misrepresentation is probably better than any other record that they have, Mr. President. They could not, they could, they could not uh, make a statement that stacks up if they tried, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I've said, we will continue to scale up the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccine becomes available. The states, Mr. President, will play their part in that, Mr. President, along with doctors' surgeries, uh, in-reach teams into residential aged care facilities and pharmacists around the country, as well as Commonwealth based vaccination clinics as they all come online, Mr President, and a hundred of those will come online next week, Mr President. So we will continue to ramp up the, the vaccination process with the availability of uh, vaccine, and none of Labor's relentless negativity will hold us back. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working to create a stronger economy with more jobs? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Molan for his question, and I know his deep interest in seeing the success of Australia, in seeing the continued success of our economy, and in seeing continued jobs growth for Australians. And the good news, the great news for Australians today is that that jobs growth as part of our economic recovery plan has continued and is continuing strongly. Indeed, Mr President, we welcome today the fact that the unemployment rate has fallen from 6.3 per cent to 5.8 per cent in February. Employment has increased by some 88,700 people. Mr President, to be back above its March 2020 levels. Let all senators just reflect on that fact for a moment. Employment in Australia is back above the levels that existed in March 2020. The overall increase in employment was driven, driven by full-time jobs. In fact, full-time jobs grew by some 89,100. And indeed, as Senator Abetz said before, you'd expect some cheering from those opposite. You would expect some positivity from those opposite, rather than the deathly silence the deathly silence that the merchants of doom and gloom over there have. You know, they, want, you know, they want the vaccine program to fail. They want the economy to fail. They just want to see negative outcomes. They don't want to celebrate in Australia's success. We know there's a job to continue to do, and we are determined to keep doing that job. But we welcome the fact that building on the first two quarters Order. in Australia's history of back-to-back 3% plus growth, we have seen that translate into jobs growth. And that jobs growth means more opportunities for more Australians, more security for more Australian families, and our policies are designed to keep that going into the future. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And based on those figures, can the minister inform the Senate on how the government's strong economic management is creating more jobs? and what confidence this provides as we transition out of emergency and temporary support measures. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's been the greatest global shock to the economy since the Great Depression. But our policies and the approach that we've taken in Australia and the work of Australian businesses and Australian people have kept Australia safe and secure. They've kept our economy strong, and that is evidenced in terms of these job figures. Indeed, Mr President, today we've seen Prime Minister Gillard's former economic adviser Stephen Kukoulos described these figures as, and I quote, some pretty good labour force numbers, whichever way you cut it. This recovery has been remarkably good, he said. This recovery has Order. been remarkably good, he says. Order. And indeed, Mr President, we are pleased to see the recovery continuing. But we know, Mr President, that more work needs to be done, that we continue to work through the policies that are necessary to keep delivering for Australians, but already unemployment is above the forecast of the RBA, better than the forecast of the Treasury, and those jobs Order. are Senator good news Birmingham. for all Senator Australians. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on further measures the government is taking to support the next phase of our economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. 
Well, Mr. President, under our economic recovery plan, we've been investing some $251 billion of economic support to Australians, to businesses, to households, to families across the country. And that continues. Significant parts of that economic support package continue. And of course, we have added to it in recent weeks as well. As we enter the next phases with the end of the JobKeeper program that we introduced with the largest single intervention ever in the Australian economy, we have subsequently implemented a $1.2 billion tourism and aviation recovery package, providing 800,000 half-price airfares across the country to get Australians travelling, to make sure we support those sectors that we need to target to continue to save and to create jobs for Australians. Our SME loan guarantee scheme, widely welcomed by businesses, providing some $40 billion in lending support all of it designed to keep the jobs growth we're seeing going into the future. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, the president of the European Commission indicated the previous blockage of exports of the vaccine to Australia would not be a one-off. Does the minister for health stand by his previous assurance that the European Commission blocking the international shipment of vaccines will, and I quote, not affect the pace of the rollout. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Brown, for her question. Um, Mr President, we are in a very, very fortunate position in this country that we have a sovereign capacity with respect to the manufacture of vaccines. Uh, and we, we will have in this country uh, approximately 50 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that will be made in Australia, and they start coming online uh, later this month, Mr. President. And, and, that, and that capacity will continue to ramp up. And as that capacity ramps up, so will the supply, for, uh, the, so will the vaccination rate uh, and the supplies that we uh, distribute to providers out to. Uh, our vaccination uh, processes around the country, Mr. President. So our vaccination process in this country is largely reliant on our sovereign capacity. We have other capacities, of course. We continue to receive uh, regular uh, shipments of Pfizer vaccine, and of course those are being applied through the process. Well, uh, Mr. Senator, I'll take Senator Watts' interjection. We continue to receive, uh, based on our schedules, our, our, our supplies of Pfizer vaccine. And we are extremely fortunate, Mr. President, extremely fortunate that we have contracted the local manufacture of 50 million doses of Australian-made uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which will start ramping up as of later this month and through April, Mr. President. So that next week, over 1,000. Next week, over 1,000 GPs will start vaccinating process, increasing to over four and a half thousand. Uh, during April, Mr. President. So the supplies will increase based on our sovereign manufacturing capacity, uh, and the ramping up of the vaccination process will continue uh, as that sovereign capacity comes on supply. And later in the year, Mr. President, uh, we we look to other supp other supplies being available as they go through Order, the Senator appropriate Colbeck. approval Senator processes. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On Tuesday, the minister representing the Minister for Health said, and I quote, "Other vaccines may come online to support the vaccination of Australians as the approved process continues." End quote. What other vaccines was the minister referring to? What negotiations are underway to secure these other vaccines? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, it would be really good if Labor listened to what has been said by the government over a period of time, rather Order. than trying to misrepresent it in the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said in the chamber before, and the Minister of Health has also said in the chamber before, we have access to 20 million doses of Pfizer vaccine. We have access to uh, 50, million dollars, 50 million doses of vaccine that is being manufactured in Australia. We are, looking to, we are looking to the potential for 51 million doses of Novavax, Mr President, pending its regulatory approval, Mr President. So there are, and it has been well publicised over a period of time, uh, and of course we also have access to 25.6 million doses through the COVAX structure. So, Mr. President, there are a number 
of other sources of vaccine to make up that 150 million doses that we have coming on stream, Mr. President. And so those Order. as they are Senator approved Colbeck, and become available, the answer will has be available expired. To Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, Senator Brown is on her feet. A final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given the effect of the slow and bungled rollout of the vaccination program on the economy and jobs, is the Morrison government now reconsidering ending JobKeeper in just 10 days? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, I completely reject the premise of the question. Uh, we have continued to grow and build the rollout of va the vaccine, vaccine, COVID vaccines across this country as we said we would. We have continued and, and in line with su available supply, Mr. President. In line with available supply, we're in a very enviable position in this country, Mr. President, where we have been able to start the vaccination process with a full assessment of each of the vaccines that we're applying by our world-leading Therapeutic Goods Administration. And instead of the relentless negativity of Labor, who seek to undermine the confidence in the vaccination process. It would be good if the Labor Party continues, if, if they decided to support the process and continue to work with government in the interest of Australians Order. to ensure that they have available uh, a vaccine, Order. which they will, Mr. President, which they will. Order, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Cash. Did any of your female staff members advise you? To hire, uh, to not hire. Sorry, can I ask? There's a bit of discussion over here. Sorry about the question list order. Um, sorry, can I ask you to commence again, Senator Waters? My yes, apologies. thanks, President. My question is to Minister Cash. Did any of your female staff members advise you not to hire or to rehire Andrew Hudson, or warn you in any way of his history of poor behaviour towards women? The Minister for. Um, Sorry, Senator, the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you for the question. Uh, the answer to the question is no. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, President. I'm happy if the minister needs to take that first question on notice to assure herself that that is in fact correct. Um, but I shall persist. Did the uh, minister at any time? tell the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister's office of any concerns that may have been raised about Mr Hudson and his attitude to women? Senator Cash. Uh, well, uh, Mr President, Mr Hudson, if I recall, worked for me four years ago for a short period of time as an assistant media adviser. Um, and the answer is again no. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, President. Did Mr Hudson work for you at any time when Ms Brittany Higgins or Ms Rochelle Miller also worked for you? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In relation to Ms Higgins, no. In relation to Ms Michelle Miller, there may have been a crossover of three or four weeks, but I would need to take advice on that because it was, as I said, around four years ago. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Minister Birmingham. For obvious reasons, cinemas have had to close throughout COVID-19. Most of them have had to rely on JobKeeper for the past year just to tread water. Even though most businesses are getting back to normal because, because of the situation overseas, where, particularly in the US, where there are no blockbuster movies uh, being released, making, uh, making it difficult to attract patronage, is the government looking at a targeted package to support independent cinemas, and what support is being considered if this is the case? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Patrick for uh, his question and his interest in an important part of, uh, of the uh, Australian economy and uh, an important part of the small business and medium business community uh, across Australia. And as everybody in this chamber appreciates, many Australians and many Australian businesses have experienced significant challenges in the past 12 months, uh, and the cinema sector has particularly been one of those. Uh, we are acutely aware of the fact that independent cinemas make up approximately 30 per cent of the cinema exhibition sector in Australia, uh, and that they have uh, been impacted particularly by 
COVID-19 uh, and especially by uh, the absence of the usual blockbusters, as, uh, as you said, Senator Patrick, uh, flowing through to them uh, to help attract crowds back in, even as some of those restrictions have been lifted. Uh, it's hard to disaggregate the, uh, the elements of support provided, but across the arts and entertainment sector, some $730 million of assistance has been provided uh, via JobKeeper. Um, other, of course, payments, as uh, the Senate is well aware, have been made uh, to uh, small and medium businesses. Uh, other measures, such as the lost carryback provisions, uh, will provide uh, assistance to many cinemas as well. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we continue to work closely uh, with um, all industry sectors to understand the particular circumstances that they find themselves in. Uh, we uh, have acted in relation to, for example, travel agents uh, providing some, uh, I think, more than a quarter of a billion dollars of, uh, of uh, support there for a sector uh, essentially shut down. Uh, we will keep our approach in the targeted, proportionate way we've indicated and will certainly continue uh, to listen carefully to the independent cin cinema sector uh, and to work with them uh, over the weeks and months ahead. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Minister. You will be aware that of the 51 cinemas in South Australia, 41 of them are independent, and I appreciate what you've said about paying JobKeeper. But JobKeeper is about to end. You, you're going to put, you potentially will put people in a position where you've supported them throughout JobKeeper only to let them fall over a cliff at the end. Is there a package for, specifically for cinemas, and when will you announce it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. As I said, there's been a, a lot of uh, different targeted measures that, uh, that we've deployed uh, during the course of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some of those targeted measures uh, um, launched last year have uh, been as diverse as for sectors uh, such as exhibiting zoos and aquariums, for example, recognising the unique nature of their circumstances that although JobKeeper, although JobKeeper provided, pardon the pun, Senator Ayres. Senator Patrick, on a point of order. Just on a point of order, my, my question was directed at independent cinema, cinemas, not at other industries. Is there going to be a package for independent cinemas? I've allowed you to remind the minister of the question, Senator Patrick. The minister has 33 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. As, uh, as I was saying there, we have um, targeted assistance over and above um, JobKeeper and small business payments and, uh, and other economy-wide measures throughout the course of the pandemic, some of it uh, such as those that I outlined at the height of the pandemic, if you like, others more recently through the course of this year in relation to the travel agency sector. And as I said, in relation to the primary question, uh, we are acutely aware of the particular situation that independent cinemas find themselves in, uh, and we continue to look very carefully at that sector and to engage very closely with it. Well, Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. The, there is 10 days until uh, JobKeeper finishes and decisions are being made now. I'm aware of two cinemas in regional South Australia who have already made the decision to close and others that are very close. Will the minister, as a South Australian senator and a minister of the government, undertake to personally contact them? Uh, I'll provide details to see exactly what they may need to get them through the, this difficult time. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, of, of course, Senator Patrick, I'm always uh, happy to, uh, to engage uh, with small businesses, with constituents, uh, and indeed to work cooperatively with senators across this place to understand uh, particular needs that, uh, that may be there. As I indicated in the previous question, uh, the government's very committed to working with the independent cinema sector uh, and, to, uh, and to ensuring uh, its viability and to understanding the unique circumstances it face. We have uh, already launched various initiatives in relation to getting audiences back into uh, to cinemas. Uh, the, uh, the 26 December initiative by Screen Australia uh, around our Summer of Cinema campaign uh, focused and highlighted a number of Australian titles to try to help uh, create and generate more interest in return to cinemas. Uh, we equally are supporting other parts of the, uh, the arts sector in generating more content, more Australian content, but also attracting more movie production here. Uh, but we're very committed to working with those in independent cinemas, and I'm very happy, as I say, to speak directly with them, Senator Patrick. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, 
small and family business center the cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how today's labour force figures show how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is supporting Australians into jobs and Australia's economic recovery? Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his question. And, uh, Mr President, the labour force figures that have been released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics they show that the Australian labour market, and that is of course the employers out there, it continues to recover strongly in February 2021. What we saw this uh, last month was employment actually increased by 88,700 over the month, and that exceeded all market expectations. Importantly, all states and territories across Australia recorded a rise in employment over the month. So what you're now seeing is the ending of those COVID restrictions are well and truly seeing the states and territories now uh, create jobs. There are now more than 13 million Australians in work. And what that means, Mr President, is the level of employment is now 3,600 above the pre-COVID level in March 2020. And in fact, it's 876,400 or 7.2 per cent higher than the trough in the labour market recorded in May 2020. Mr President, in terms of job creation in the month of February, the increase in employment over the month, I am pleased to say, was due entirely to a surge in full-time jobs. What you saw was around 89,100 full-time jobs. That's how much are they rose by in February. We now have full-time employment at a record high in Australia of 8,895,000. Uh, women also, as the uh, Minister for Women knows, women accounted for the vast majority of the rise in employment in February. Uh, that was up by 74,100. And what we also see now is that is at a record high uh, of 6,174,200. Mr President, we also saw the unemployment rate drop by half a percentage point. So what we're seeing is a strong Order. recovery Cash, in the labour Senator market. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Minister, how will the government continue to support our labour market to recover from this once-in-a-century economic shock uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government's economic recovery plan, described um, as key to saving jobs by the OECD, will, to conti will continue to create employment opportunities in Australia and also to secure Australia's economic um, and labour market future. You know, as we enter the next phase of COVID-19, because we know uh, there is a phase, we need to actually come out of it, we have our $74 billion job maker plan. And that's, of course, putting in place major supports for employers and the Australian workplace. Uh, of course, as the Minister for Skills, I'd like to uh, highlight the government's strong focus, the strong focus on what we've done to support apprentices and trainees throughout Australia. Our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy has now seen over 123,000 apprentices kept on since COVID-19 commenced. And of course, the uh, boosting apprentices commencement has now supported over 100,000 new commencements. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, as we enter the next stage of our economic recovery from COVID-19, why should Australians have confidence in the resilience of our labour market and the potential of our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the Prime Minister and the, the Treasurer say, there is a long road ahead, but the economic outlook is looking optimistic. Uh, when you look at the performance of Australia, we have outperformed all major advanced nations with more Australians in work today uh, than before the crisis. As I said, we now have seen um, in excess of 13 million Australians are now in work, and the level of employment today is actually higher than what it was at the height of the crisis. We continue to see, though, consumer confidence, business confidence and job ads grow to higher levels uh, than before the pandemic. Despite the impacts of COVID-19, the latest ABS data also shows that an additional 46,000 businesses were trading over the year to June 2020. Again, Mr President, what the government is all about is putting in place that right economic framework to ensure that across Australia businesses can prosper, grow and, of course, create more jobs for Australians. Senator Kitching. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In my home state of Victoria, more than 410,000 workers and over 130,000 businesses will be affected by the Morrison government ending JobKeeper in just 10 days. How many of the more than 410,000 workers will lose their jobs and how many of the more than 130,000 businesses will be forced to close their doors? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Kitching for her question. It's a question that is, is eerily reminiscent of questions that I recall facing at each of the transition points in relation to JobKeeper. When the government announced that there would be a phasing out of JobKeeper after the first six months and we announced the journey to do so, at each of those transition points, the opposition would come in here and they would ask questions about, indeed, what would occur and potentially how many jobs would be lost. And yet at each of those transition points to date, what we have seen is that the number of jobs have kept growing up. That at each of those transition points, more Australian businesses have graduated off of JobKeeper, more Australian employees have graduated off of JobKeeper, and that the number of people employed across Australia has kept going up to the point where, as Senator Cash and I have both told the Senate today, Total employment across Australia now stands back at a level in advance of where it was in March 2020. Total employment is back at a level before JobKeeper came into effect. Now we acknowledge, Mr. President, we acknowledge that there will be for some businesses, for some businesses, potential challenges ahead. We've always acknowledged that that would be the case. We have always acknowledged that that would be the case, Mr. President. But what we've sought to do throughout the pandemic is put in place the safeguards to get Australia through the worst of it. And now, as we've come very clearly, very clearly through the worst of the pandemic, through the worst of the economic crisis, we've made those measures more targeted. We've ensured those measures hone in on the parts of order. the Australian economy. Senator, um, Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. On, a relevant, on relevance, Mr. President, I asked how many of the more than 410,000 workers will lose their jobs, how many of the more than 130,000 businesses. I'm happy to take a percentage or a number. Senator Kitching, um, I think while the minister is talking about the specific program in question and specifically talking about numbers employed in the labour force, I, I, I can't instruct him how to answer the question, but I do believe he's being directly relevant. There's the opportunity after question time, albeit slightly later than normal, to debate those matters. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. Well, as I addressed very clearly and through the answer to this question, we've seen jobs growth continue. The forecasts are for jobs growth to continue. And we will continue Order, Senator Birmingham. to support Time industries. The answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you. On Tuesday, Victoria's 11 regional tourism boards signed a le joint letter to Minister Tian, calling on the Morrison government to urgently add more destinations to its tourism support package. Will the Morrison government now add more destinations in regional Victoria to its tourism support package? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, our tourism support package, $1.2 billion, some 800,000 half price airfares that we are supporting across the country to get people moving, is a package that we said at the outset, from day one, that we would continue to monitor the impacts across different regions of Australia and target and shift support and subsidy across Australia as necessary. And so we will do that. We are doing it. We will continue to do that through the life of this program. Around, I think it's 46,000 discounted flights per week are being supported under this program. And in doing so, they're going to help to shift many, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians around the country, generating more tourism activity, more bed nights, more people booking experiences, more opportunities for Australians to take a break, but also for Australians to support the jobs and small businesses of tourism operators across Australia, and we will keep making sure that package Order. responds Senator Birmingham, as necessary. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And I'm going to read a quote from the Victorian Tourism Industry Council chief, and I don't think she will take great um, satisfaction from your answer to the first supplementary. 
Ms Mariani has said, and I quote, many operators have said that, that they have already told people that they can't keep them employed. So these are decisions being made right now. People cannot see a way out of this. Why is the Morrison government turning its back on Victorian businesses? Senator Birmingham. Birmingham. Well, Mr President, I, I know that those opposite want to see everything fail. Um, that's their whole modus operandi. It's but what we've seen in the short period of time, what we've seen in the short period of time since this program was announced was a, have been a significant spike in the number of airline bookings across Australia. A significant spike in relation to people getting back to business, getting back to travelling and making those sorts of bookings around Australia, including very much across regional Australia. We have seen, we have seen airlines report lifts in their bookings. We have seen lifts in bookings elsewhere across the tourism and travel industry. And we have promised that we will continue to adapt this program responsive to the bookings and information and data that we get from the aviation industry and the tourism industry throughout its rollout. This is about us once again implementing a program targeted and responsive to the needs of Australians to protect their Order, businesses Senator and protect Birmingham. their jobs. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on the potential impacts of the announced early closure of the Yalorn coal-fired power station on the security of electricity supplies in Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Canavan for a very important question. Um, your lawn has provided the reliable generation needed to keep energy prices low and the grid secure Order. in Victoria and the national electricity market for decades. As an employer of around 500 staff and an important contributor to the local economy, our thoughts are with the Order. workers, their families and local business owners who rely on the power Order. station for their livelihoods. Senators while, the Commonwealth, while the Commonwealth Government understands this is a commercial decision, the exit of 1,480 megawatts of reliable energy generation brings with it reliability and affordability concerns. As an essential service, the Commonwealth Government expects the market to step up to deliver enough dispatchable generation to keep the lights on and prices low once your lawn closes. While coal exits impact reliability and system security, the major impact for consumers will be the significant increase in prices if not adequately replaced with dispatchable capacity. We've already seen this happen with the closures of uh, Northern in South Australia and most recently Hazelwood in Victoria, where wholesale prices skyrocketed by 85%. The Commonwealth will model the impact of the closure to hold industry to account on the dispatchable capacity needed to ensure affordable, reliable power for consumers. This will deliver needed transparency around the impact of your lawn's closure. We're not going to stand idly by and watch a loss of reliability and affordability. We want to see industry step Order. up, but we also want to see that consumers Order. are properly looked after and we get the Order. affordability and reliability that Victorians Order. deserve. Senator and indeed. Wong that all Australians deserve. What we won't do is risk the stability and affordability of our energy system as those opposite would do. Labor has a 2050 energy policy, but Senator won't explain Rez, how they'll get Senator there, Watt, they won't explain Watt, how much it will cost. Labor has tried Senator it before Rennick. and will try it again. We're supporting Order. technology, not taxes. That's Order. how you bring down power prices and deliver Order, reliable Senator energy. Seselja. Order. I will call Senator Canavan when there is order. Order. We've been here a while. We'll be a while longer until, until there's silence. Senator Canavan. Uh, can the minister outline how the Liberal and Nationals government is encouraging investment in reliable coal and gas power generation? Senator Seselja. Senator Seselja. Thank you. Delivering reliable and affordable energy is one of the highest priorities of this government. And in Senator Canavan's home state, we are investing in a number of projects that will help secure the reliable and more affordable energy we need, and we know this will drive further private investment. We're investing in Copper String 2.0 with, with over a thousand kilometres of high voltage transmission line between Mount Isa and Hewenden. Copper String will deliver 750 direct construction jobs and connect North Queensland with national electricity market to help deliver lower cost power. We're also delivering more investment in reliable 
generation through our underwriting new generation investment program. We've got a 13-point plan to ensure Australian gas is working for all Australians. Those opposite have no energy policy, just a plan for more and bigger taxes. We have a plan focused on technology, not taxes. We will protect jobs, we will deliver reliable energy and we will drive down costs left. for households and Order. businesses. Order. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, can the minister advise the Senate on the government's actions to deliver more reliable and more affordable power to Australians and any risks to increase reliability and affordability for households Order. During and question. businesses? Senator Watt, I've called your name numerous times during this question time. Senator Seselgis. Thank you very much, Mr President. It's great to hear Senator, Senator Costanza over there interjecting again. He was a bit quiet. He was a bit quiet yesterday, uh, but keeping energy prices down and maintaining security. <laughs> Order, Senator Watt. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Canavan. I think the clock hasn't been uh, set for the answer. Um, I think we've gone for about 20 seconds, so I'll set it at 40 seconds. Ten. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll commence it on the vice from the clerk. Give Senator Soldier the full minute. And this is, and honestly, I might have noticed that if there wasn't so much noise in the chamber, Senator Soldier. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Answer. And keeping energy prices down, maintaining secure power supply is central to our COVID economic recovery and is critical to supporting jobs. There are, however, a number of risks to this recovery. What Labor don't understand is that we need sufficient dispatchable energy capacity to keep prices low, keep the lights on and to back up the record investment in renewables. That's why we've set a target for the electricity sector to deliver 1,000 megawatts of new dispatchable energy to replace the Liddell power station before it closes down in 2023. That's why we'll back a gas power Order. plant in the Hunter if the private sector doesn't replace Senator Liddell's Watt. capacity. And that's why we are Senator unlocking Canavan. billions in new investment into our energy system through the te Technology Investment Roadmap. We support technology and totally reject Labor's taxes because their taxes won't keep prices down, they won't deliver uh, for our energy system and they won't protect our economy. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Yesterday, in response to a question about the government's plan for victim survivors of domestic violence to fund their own escape plans using their superannuation, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, We've been consulting with various groups around the country. We're listening to those concerns. That measure is now under review. Can the minister now rule this measure out? The Minister for um, Superannuation Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator McAllister for her question and her sincere and enduring interest in the economic welfare of women in retirement. This was a measure that was first raised in the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement, and we have been actively listening to stakeholders in this area and reflecting on their views. Stakeholders have raised concerns about this proposal. That is true. And we understand that their concerns, and, uh, and as both the Prime Minister and I have said this week, the measure is now under review. And that's exactly, exactly what that means. The measure was in fact originally proposed, you might recall, by HESTA, the super fund that has around 80 per cent of its members as women. Order. And it was in fact not just supported by HESTA but also by the industry superannuation, uh, ind the industry superannuation funds generally. Um, the most important thing here is that we get the safeguards right. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get those safeguards right, we need to be able to um, get the safeguards right. Order. The safeguards need to be in place to ensure that, uh, that women in, that are taking money out of their superannuation to flee a dangerous relationship are not being in any way coerced to do so. If we can't get those safeguards right and if we get the feedback from those frontline workers in particular Senator, who know the difficulty that faces victims fleeing violent relationships every single day, well, the measure simply won't proceed. Mr President, the Morrison government is acting to support women's safety in their homes and in their communities, in their workplaces and online. 
The Commonwealth has led the way with the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, which will be succeeded by the national plan next year. We've committed more Order. than $1 billion to women and children facing family, domestic and sexual violence since coming to office in 2013. There will be further consultation as we develop the next national action plan to reduce violence against women and their children Order, as Senator the government Hume, engages with key industry and family. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Domestic violence victim survivor Nicole Lee has told the ABC, and I quote, we don't even have any super to tap into. And the other side of that is that we shouldn't be tapping into super to escape from violence. Why does the minister think it is, and I quote, a terrific opportunity to make a woman who wants to leave a violent relationship choose between her financial security and her personal safety? Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President. In fact, it wasn't just me that said that we wanted to give women an opportunity to leave a violent or menacing relationship. It, in fact, was the CEO of Hester who said that while women already retire with almost half of the super of men, they shouldn't, and they shouldn't have to use their super for this purpose. But family violence is one of the rare situations in which short-term financial needs are more compelling than the need to preserve superannuation for retirement. Order, Senator Hume. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order direct relevance. The CEO of a super fund is not the minister. The minister was asked about her quote, her quote, her own statement, a terrific opportunity, and I'd ask her to return to the question. Um, Senator Wong, when the question concludes with why does the minister think it is and refers to a quote the minister's made, I think it is also directly relevant if the minister is actually referring to supporting material in that. I'm listening carefully to the answer, um, and, but at the moment I believe that is directly relevant. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. Indeed, it wasn't just me that felt that this was an opportunity to give to women who were fleeing a menacing or dangerous relationship. It was also the CEO of the Hester Superannuation Fund, and indeed it was Matt Linden the Deputy CEO of Industry Senator Super Wong Australia. On a point of order. Mr President, this is a prior statement the minister has made. I understand your ruling enables you know, some other material, but the, the question goes to comments this minister has made, and ask her to, I would ask her to return to the question. Um, again, Senator Wong, I will carefully review the hand side. I genuinely believe that if someone is being asked why they hold a particular view, it is directly relevant for them to refer to supporting material at, that may have been of persuasion or other matters. Um, but I, I will again review the Hansard in detail and make sure I come back when we next sit. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Indeed, I am not the only one that believes that this is an opportunity for women to flee a dangerous or menacing relationship. Matt Linden, the Deputy CEO of Industry Super Australia, said allowing access to super in special circumstances could be the difference between someone seeking vital help or not. Order, Senator or Hume. Not. Time for the answers expired. Order. Order. Senator McAllister has the call for a final supplementary question. Thank on my you. right, on my left and right now, order. Senator McAllister. Domestic Violence New South Wales CEO Delia Donovan has said, and I quote, it's absolutely not okay in terms of creating further debt and poverty later on for women who are already affected by the gender pay gap. One in three women has no super. Most women under the age of 45 have a super balance of less than $45,000. I ask again, why does the minister think it would be a terrific opportunity to create further debt and poverty for women leaving violent relationships? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. And I answer again that this is an opportunity for women to leave a dangerous or, or, or menacing relationship. And it wasn't just me that thought that this is a good idea. In fact, it was not just the CEO of Hester, not just Matthew, Matthew Linden, the deputy CEO of Industry Super Australia, but it was in fact the board of Hester. Can I tell you who was on the board of Hester? The, on the board of Hester are representatives Order. of the ACTU. Right. The ACTU were on the board of Hester. Order. The ACTU are on the board of Hester. Who else is on the board of Hester that thought that this was a very good idea? Let me tell you. Order. In fact, the United Workers Union are also represented on that board. Order. I believe that's Senator Walsh's and Senator, Senator Watts' union. 
the Health Services Union is represented on the board of Hester. I believe that might be oh, Senator Kitching. Well, I know you had something to do with the Health Services Union. I'm not sure whether you're a member anymore. Can I also tell you that the Australian Services Union, I think that's your union, Senator Wong. Is that not correct? I think Order, your union Senator also Hume, thought that that was a good idea. Time for the answer has expired. Order. 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 I will. Order. I'm order. Order. We will stay here and run down the clock until there's silence so I can call Senator Askew. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister confirm that there is up to $13.8 billion in lost and unclaimed superannuation waiting for Australians to find? And also advise what measure the Morrison government has put in place to make it easier for people to claim their lost super? including in my home state of Tasmania. The Minister for Superannuation and Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Well, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for this question, because this is indeed a terrific opportunity. <laughs> it's exactly right. There is $13.8 billion in lost and unclaimed superannuation that's simply waiting to be claimed by ordinary Order. Australians. In Order fact, on my right. Senator Hume to continue. In fact, New South Wales tops the nation in unclaimed amounts. There's around $3.4 billion, and New South Wales holds six of the top 10 postcodes. Mr President, in my home state of Victoria, that follows with $2.2 billion in unclaimed or lost super. Then your home state, Senator Watt, $1.9 billion is sitting there. Western Australia, $1.2 billion. South Australia with $800 million and ACT with $230 million. and Indeed, even the Northern Territory has around $160 million in lost and unclaimed super waiting to find a home. And Mr President, Senator Askew's home state of Tasmania is also on this list with $135 million in lost and unclaimed super. And in fact, beautiful Launceston, where Senator Askew is a terrific representative, uh, that ranks number one in her state. That's the number one postcode in her state for lost and unclaimed amounts. Mr President, this is Australians' hard-earned wages, and it could be from your first job, from a casual job that you held years ago and forgot all about. You may have changed your name, you may have changed your address, you may have lost your super fund from many years ago because it's been inactive for a period of time. But by law, your super fund is now, thanks to the Morrison government, required to transfer certain amounts to the ATO, which then becomes unclaimed super money. Unlike super funds, the ATO does not charge fees, and thanks to the reforms passed by this government, it proactively consolidates any unclaimed money into an eligible and active account wherever possible. So I encourage all senators to review the lost amounts data that, uh, and share that news with their, with their constituents. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please explain to the Senate how easy it is for Australians to find their lost superannuation? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. It is, in fact, very easy to find your lost or unclaimed super, and it is also very quick, quicker than it takes to order a cup of coffee, you can, or you can find out if a slice of that $13.8 billion belongs to you. All you have to do is jump onto the MyGov website, link to the ATO portal, and click the Manage My Super link. It is that easy. So if you've lost or you've forgotten your super, it'll be sitting there waiting for you. You can scroll through and you can actually consolidate your lost and forgotten amounts into your active primary super fund, all for free, making sure that your super works much harder for you. It is that simple. And the government has requested that the ATO do that work on your behalf. So there's no need to search, there's no need to hand over information. If, you've forgotten, if you have forgotten super, that the ATO will use data matching technology uh, that only the ATO has to match your lost super to you. So, um, and right, that happens all right on your MyGov account. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline what additional actions are being taken by the Morrison government to proactively reunite working Australians with their lost super? Senator Hume. 
Thank you again, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Askew. Yes, I am very proud to inform the Senate that the Morrison government has already, in fact, reunited Australians with billions of dollars in lost and unclaimed superannuation. And data released by the ATO for the financial year ending June 2020 shows that the Morrison government's reforms have had an enormous impact on the retirement balances of millions of Australians, reducing unclaimed super by around $7 billion compared to the 30th of June 2019. In just seven months, $7 billion in lost and unclaimed super has been reunited back into the accounts of hardworking Australians. This is on top of the Morrison government's reforms that they have, of the incredibly effective protecting your super reforms that allowed that for that proactive reuni reuniting of super um, with lost and unclaimed super, and also capped fees on low balances and inactive accounts, making your super work so much harder for you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Prime Minister confirmed that advice was being sought regarding the scope of the Attorney General's portfolio responsibilities, which would be removed, which would be removed from the Attorney General on his return to work. When was this advice sought, and by whom? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Look, those are details that I do not have to hand. I'd have to take those on notice for the Senator as to specifically when it was sought and specifically who made the request, um, as, uh, as we have outlined to the Senate uh, quite clearly. Uh, the uh, government uh, sought that advice out of an abundance of caution. Um, we have, out of a further abundance of caution, uh, acted uh, in a number of interim ways uh, in relation to engagement that the uh, Attorney-General um, or his office uh, would have on matters as they pertain particularly to uh, the Federal Court uh, and to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation um, pending the receipt of that advice. Um, I'm not aware of updates to, uh, to uh, any of those precautions that, uh, that have or are being taken at present, uh, but of course, as, uh, as all senators are aware, uh, in the interim at this point in time, uh, Senator Cash is, uh, is uh, acting as the Attorney General and is therefore without any risk of conflict in a position to be able to fulfil uh, all of the uh, normal duties of the Attorney General um, in relation to uh, any ongoing arrangements that uh, may be necessary uh, when the Attorney General returns to work. Uh, it would be the intention um, of, uh, of the government, I'm sure, that, uh, that the Assistant Minister of the Attorney General, Senator Stoker, uh, would, uh, would um, undertake uh, those relevant duties as is appropriate to ensure uh, that, uh, that all duties are uh, fully handled. It is uh, it's not, Mr President, uh, unusual in relation to any potential for a perceived conflict of interest to exist uh, for uh, other ministers to be asked to handle matters in relation to such a perceived conflict of interest, uh, but the government is acting cautiously uh, and, uh, and awaits that advice on this matter. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I do have a supplementary. Did this request include advice on whether Attorney General Porter is a fit and proper person to return to the position at all? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, the advice the government is seeking is, uh, is exactly the nature that, uh, that I have outlined. It relates to appropriately taking precautions in relation to ensuring uh, that there is uh, no real or potential for perceived conflict of interest to exist uh, whilst the Attorney-General undertakes defamation proceedings that he has publicly announced. Uh, the Attorney-General, like any member of parliament, like any Australian, Order. has, has Mr. President, uh, a right uh, to be able to uh, use the existing laws of the land uh, to be able to pursue uh, a defamation allegation, and in and in and in doing so, Mr. President, and in doing so, an independent judicial process will no doubt have an opportunity to hear the claims that are made, uh, and to and to ensure uh, that through that process, uh, the Senator matters Birmingham are properly for the independent. Has expired. Senator, Ka um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary <laughs> thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, uh, thank you. Why should the Australian people accept a part-time Attorney-General on a full-time salary? 
Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, as I said, if the senator had listened to the primary question, it is not unusual. It is not unusual, and there will be many precedents on all sides of politics that ministers, if there is any chance of a potential for a conflict of interest to exist, that there be acting arrangements put in place in relation to those particular responsibilities and duties. And Mr. President, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that the Attorney General and the Minister for Workplace Relations, when he returns to work, and will continue to pursue the type of work that, uh, that the government has seen, indeed only today, with the passage of legislation through this chamber that is ensuring greater certainty for casual employees, greater certainty uh, for small businesses, and avoiding the risk of some $39 billion, $39 billion of potential liabilities that many business organisations and representatives said could have pushed many businesses Order. over the Senator edge. Birmingham, Mr. President, time for the Mr. President ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator, but could I quickly table a document? Just, I want to join with the Speaker in the other place on tabling a statement in respect of Commonwealth Day earlier this month, and I include in that, as is customary, a message from Her Majesty the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. It is leave granted. It is. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated. In doing so, as I had indicated earlier in the day, uh, the government is bringing forward legislation, the Archives and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, uh, which will uh, seek to achieve the very uh, important um, um, outcome of guaranteeing to any individuals who participate uh, in the inquiry and review into Parliament's workplace practices uh, that is being undertaken by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Commissioner Kate Jenkins, uh, through the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, that their participation can be done with the utmost confidence uh, of its confidentiality, uh, that such legislation uh, will be able uh, to provide any existing or former staff member in this place, or indeed any other individual seeking to make submission, the confidence that if they make a submission, if they participate in any way in that review, uh, and they wish for their information uh, to remain confidential, it will remain confidential. I, uh, I thank uh, various parties for their um, advocacy in relation to this matter. Uh, it certainly was the government's intention at the outset in using the Human Rights Commission uh, that we believed there were sufficient protections in place to guarantee confidentiality. This legislation will, if you like, provide um, uh, an absolute additional layer of safeguard to that, uh, such, that uh, such that I hope everyone can engage in doing so. The government recognises the urgency of passing such legislation to give that confidence, hence the hours motion that I am proposing. question is, Speaking to the motion, Senator Waters. Yes, I seek leave to make a short statement. I can speak to the motion, Senator Waters. Oh, thank Lord you. Uh, look, I'll just flag that whilst we don't like the practice of last-minute hours motions, given the content of the bill that is uh, being sought to be uh, passed through this chamber today, and we understand early in the House next week, given that it will facilitate uh, staffers and former staffers providing confidential evidence to the Jenkins Culture Review, then on that basis alone we will be supporting this. And I might add we have been seeking this fix to be drafted all week, as has, I understand, uh, the opposition. So uh, we look forward to actually seeing a copy of that draft bill, which I would very much like to receive very soon, uh, and then uh, we will agree to this hour's motion. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Can I? You can speak to the motion, Senator. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wouldn't mind if uh, Senator Birmingham would would uh, clarify one thing. I, I haven't seen the bill either. I don't know the text of the bill. Uh, I, I'm uh, broadly in support of it. Um, I would like to know, in circumstances of the bill carves out um, all submissions made to the Human Rights Commission, would the government make give an undertaking that a government submission would be released released? Uh, administratively. Senator Birmingham can sort of seek leave to make another contribution now. And he can close the debate now so, and answer that query. Unless anyone else wants to speak, I'll call Senator Birmingham. There will also be 
an opportunity to debate the bill albeit briefly at the time it comes forward. Senator Patrick. Senator Birmingham. Th th thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I, I am seeking to make sure that uh, the details of the bill are shared with, uh, with minor parties, crossbench senators uh, and indeed all senators as quickly as possible, uh, and I trust that will be the case. Uh, of course, Senator Patrick, once it is shared with you, I will happily engage in relation to any details or concerns you may have. It's certainly the government's intention uh, that any individual who wishes to make public their submission obviously retains the right to do so. In, in relation to any government submissions, uh, I would, uh, would anticipate that they will be made public, uh, barring any features of particular personal confidentiality or the like that may be contained within them. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. We're now proceeding to motions to take note. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, President. I seek leave to, no to take note of the response uh, given to me uh, by uh, Senator Cash uh, to my question of her. Now, I asked Minister Cash about uh, staff members that had been employed in her office that yesterday uh, were revealed as uh, having disgusting attitudes to women and frequently sharing those in the workplace. Now, folk might realise that yesterday there was an ABC article where three Liberal staffers alleged that a particular Liberal staff member, a man, um, routinely subjected them to disgusting comments, generally displayed misogynistic behaviour. Now, last night in the Tasmanian parliament, uh, Greens leader Cassie O'Connor uh, believed that this was in fact the same man who had directed a vile slur to her while she was in the uh, process of trying to give a uh, press conference. Uh, <laughs> It's very interesting that the uh, problem males in the Liberal Party don't tend to get the sack until someone goes public with their disgusting behaviour. The behaviour is tolerated and swept under the carpet, and they're cycled through various offices rather than actually being uh, attended to and sacked, or at the very least uh, trained and uh, brought into this century rather than the 1950s, where they evidently belong. Now, <laughs> We've had successive female staffers in this place raise concerns about these issues. What more do they have to do to be listened to? These staff members yesterday had to go to the media and then they needed a, a member of parliament in a different parliament to use parliamentary privilege to identify this person before he was then asked to resign. And he was asked to resign. He wasn't sacked. He was asked to resign, which no doubt has implications for any sort of severance, severance or, or payment package that he might get. Women keep raising these concerns, and so far it seems like the Liberal Party is doing uh, sweet nothing about it until such time as the media spotlight is turned upon them. Now, Brittany Higgins's alleged rapist was asked to leave. He wasn't. He wasn't fired. He also was asked to leave. Uh, he got a pretty well-paying job soon after in some fancy lobbying firm. There were no consequences for him. Meanwhile, Ms Higgins, one of the bravest people uh, that I've uh, seen in recent years, uh, had to take the difficult decision uh, to choose her own uh, personal safety ahead of any possibility of career advancement for her in the Liberal Party. Now, Andrew Hudson, who was the staff member named by Greens leader uh, in the Tasmanian parliament yesterday and who we understand is also the staff member that those three Liberal uh, staff women were complaining of misogynistic treatment, he's been cycled around different offices. He started off in Minister Cash's office. He then got uh, recycled into the Tasmanian parliament and he came back in to work for Minister Sukar. Honestly, does nobody do anything when female staffers raise concerns about uh, sexist remarks uh, and worse sexist behaviour in the workplace? This man was well known to have disgusting attitudes and frequently give voice to them, and yet nothing was done. He just kept getting moved around. It seems like Minister Cash's office is the place you go where you might be a political problem uh, for this government, whether or not you're a perpetrator or a victim survivor. Well, 
do better, folks. Yeah. And I'm glad that we now have um, the Jenkins review, which there's now going to be a hasty patch up of a, a loophole that should have been uh, non-existent in the first place. But it's, it is deeply unsatisfactory that this government does nothing about sexism and misogyny until oh, yeah. the media spotlight is on them. It's no surprise they don't have many women in their ranks because their culture is well known. It's toxic, it's sexist and it's misogynistic. It is unsafe. So I'm very pleased that those uh, female staff members and, and Ms Brittany Higgins and Ms Rochelle Miller um, have the courage to come forward, but it shouldn't take media scrutiny to do the right thing. Clean up your own backyard. The Prime Minister keeps trying to get off these issues, but he is sending the signal that not only does he not believe women and he doesn't realise rape is a problem until his wife tells him, but that he will accept this sort of behaviour in the workplaces that he presides over. We need leadership from the Prime Minister. He needs to say that this behaviour is not going to be tolerated in his party. Uh, otherwise, we'll see more and more media stories until the government finally gets the message that women have had enough. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall